Ancient Apocalypse, Episode 6, America's Lost Civilization. <laughs> Dunking Mini Minuteman, Episode 5, Dan's really cool video thing on YouTube. Well, hello and welcome back to the Dunking. And in this episode, yeah, it's episode five of Mini Minute Man going after Graham Hancock. We're already on the downhill slide here. Pretty soon I'm going to have to find somebody else half my age to pick on. Hopefully they're as cool about it as my has been. But um, I could tell you how great this video is going to be because it's really going to be great. But I suppose I should just probably show you. So without further ado... Graham Hancock begins this episode with a bold claim. If you went to school between 1960 and 2010, you were taught an outdated history of the peopling of North America. This is the most hilarious way that Graham Hancock could start this episode. Because his entire series is predicated on the idea that archaeologists are opposed to accepting any new information that would challenge the status quo, it is very interesting to see that right off the bat he admits that the uh, story of the peopling of North America changed when, you know, presented with new evidence. Well, this is kind of a funny way for Milo to start the episode because Hancock's really got a good point here and Milo's just kind of missing it. Uh, Clovis First is one of those things of Planck's principle. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched my video um, on archaeological bias, there's absolutely no other way to know what Planck's principle is. So I'll tell you really quick. It's the principle that it takes the old guard dying off, basically, because they don't want to accept new scientific discoveries. So the old guard has to croak before the new people will step up and be able to accept these new discoveries. I couldn't remember what the name of the people were, but they the Clovis police is the term you need to search up, and you need to add the term archaeology so you're not just finding the Clovis Police Department, but you'll find tons of scientific articles that you can only read a little piece of it, but you'll still see that they're around today. There is a bunch of hardcore old dudes that have been Clovis first all their life. They were pushing back hard in the 90s. They were pushing back hard in the 2000s. A lot of them are still pushing back today. I'll post a link to one article that talks about it down there, but I encourage you to go look because, again, you can't see a lot of the articles, but if you hit those keywords, Clovis first, Clovis police archaeology and on google scholar and you'll see multiple articles that have the clovis police are still a problem blah 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 and it'll be like dated to this year some of this evidence is of course the white sands prints which are a set of footprints found in new mexico i have talked about these before and they are dated to about twenty three thousand years ago you never get a guess who they were found by archaeologists and this is why archaeologists question everything because we want to be able to further our understanding we are looking for facts and if we didn't question anything then you could just say whatever you want and no one would question it graham hancock well you better not hop in a time machine and go back to the 80s and question clovis first or you're going to be out of a job might be akin to right now if you were to start hanging your head on the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. You, you might find yourself having a hard time getting getting the field work in the future, huh? Huh. Kind of funny how that works. It's almost like it, it's almost like there's certain ideas that they won't allow you to like explore. What I will say is that episode six has the strongest start out of any episode of Ancient Apocalypse, and one that I do genuinely want to give Graham Hancock credit for, because he starts with a wonderful speech talking about the injustice of just how many indigenous sites were destroyed during the colonization of North America. He mentions the staggering statistic that 90% of indigenous earthenworks and mounds and grave sites were destroyed as westward expansion happened and fields were plowed. And now, fair warning, I am going to be critical of the way which Graham Hancock portrays uh, the paleo-indigenous population of North America, but I do want to give him credit off the bat that his heart is in the right place. It really does seem like he is trying to be aware of these problems and, you know, trying to uh, raise awareness about them. And so I really do mean when I say I genuinely appreciate it. Have you noticed the difference in approach here that Milo's taking that anybody else does? I mean, Stefan Milo will sometimes throw Hancock a bone, but Mini Minuteman's being genuine here and being like, man, this is like, I don't agree with Hancock on a lot of stuff, but this is cool. And this is one of the reasons that I, me and him get along is he's not tribal about this whole thing, which definitely helps because the tribalism makes this whole thing a big old shitty mess, which sucks. How can you find truth if both sides are beholden to a certain position? <sighs> anyway, um, Hancock's right and Milo's right to point it out. I actually grew up in the Midwest and um, St. Louis is really near where I grew up and they raised shitloads of mounds to build St. Louis. We used to go to Cahokia Mount when I was a kid as, for a field trip. Um, 
So I've been there half a dozen times or so in my life. And uh, these places, um, there's not very many of them left. Yeah, there's, there's, there's talk sometimes. There'll be a little plaque or something that talks about it. But usually, even if you go looking, and I'll warn you now, if you go dip your nose into this waters, you're, you're going to find the people that love to talk about giants. That's one of the first things you're going to find is the giant people. For whatever reason, they, they, I guess that they think that maybe giant bones are buried in these mounds or some shit. I don't know. Anyway, fair warning. You go start digging your toes into this and the, the pile of woo gets big, deep, thick and quick and it's all about Nephilim. All right, everyone put on your expedition hats because we're going on a field trip. Poverty Point is a paleo-indigenous mound site in the modern state of Louisiana. It has an enormous central mound, uh, some concentric half-circular mounds, and the remains of uh, wooden uh, ring complexes. Now, south of Poverty Point is another mound complex called the Lower Jackson Mound. And Lower Jackson Mound is old, dating to about 3000 BCE, or about 5,000 years ago. Graham Hancock claims that this is all part of some elaborate plan, and that Poverty Point Mound and the Lower Jackson Mound are connected to one another, and it was all part of some huge earthen work that, I don't know, did something. It is worth noting that the builders of the Poverty Point Mound, as well as the Jackson Mound, would have all, you know, lived in the same area and probably been exposed to the same resources and cultural influences and whatnot, and does not necessarily mean that all these sites are connected. But Milo, and I was just tooting your horn, buddy. What the hell's this? All right, since I learned that with a pothole you can point your phone at the TV, here you go. And it has to do with an even more ancient site, about two miles to the south. As we go south from Poverty Point, we come to a place called Lower Jackson Mound. And the three principal mounds of Poverty Point are lined up precisely north-south with Lower Jackson Mound. He's not just saying they're loosely related to each other. He's talking about them being directly in line with each other. That's uh, kind of a big deal, isn't it? I mean, it's worth mentioning, right? It's kind of like... Uh, I mean, that's a little bit more than just they're in the same site, which also, by the way, you're in the same area, but over a thousand years separate the building of these sites. So, I mean, he's kind of misrepresenting this here. It's almost like you didn't watch it and pay close attention or didn't do proper research. But the big bow that Graham Hancock sort of puts on all of these sites is that they are astrological mounds. They are mounds that were meant to observe the heavens and, you know, be or almost a giant clock for the, uh, you know, the, the winter and summer solstices, which there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest. There is evidence to suggest that there are many sites all around the world that all have, you know, uh, solstice oriented alignments. Now, let's brainstorm for a minute, shall we? Uh, of Why would it be that uh, so many places around the world have these solstice alignments? Uh, is it because uh, Atlanteans came out of the sea? and taught them how to make calendars or were warning them to look to the heavens to uh, guard them against the ancient evil that will wipe them out? Or is it because every single group of people around the world could look at the sky? Well, a place like Poverty Point with a bunch of different ways to observe the sun would be kind of an observatory, right? I mean, it's like a Neolithic place for astronomers to kick it, like Graham Hancock says. Yeah, these kinds of sites are common and to be expected. When the sites start playing with the sun, and when that's the entire goal of the site, the site is like made to play with the sun, or that's part of the site's like iconography. At that point, I would argue that it does kind of reek of that hermeticism, that as above, so below, and that that does kind of seem that when it's coupled with kind of advanced astronomical knowledge that it takes to do that, it does kind of seem out of place for it to show up over and over and over again. It makes sense to make a calendar. It doesn't make sense to have the sun making a snake crawl down the side of a hill in one place and then making this other thing line up where the sun hits just as this perfect spot at another. And this kind of thing seems to me like that hermeticism. And I'm not saying that hermeticism has any valid as a spiritual thing or any crap like that. I'm just saying that that was the psychological underpinnings for doing this shit. I hate having to explain that this isn't a woo channel every fucking time I make a video, Jesus Christ. 
Graham goes on to say that archaeologists are reluctant to uh, accept astronomy into uh, their field and that he we view it as, you know, an infringement into our territory, which is just foolish. Uh, one of the most amazing things about working in the field of archaeology is that it is an interdisciplinary field. We rely on the work of other people in order to be able to draw our conclusions. Uh, you need to work alongside geologists. You need to work alongside botanists. You need to work alongside zoologists. There is uh, so many fields that tie into archaeology, and without them, we would be nothing. Archaeology is, to put it broadly, the study of quite literally everything. When you go back to look at a site like this, you aren't just going back to look at one specific feature. I I'm not a paleobotanist. I don't go back in time to just look at the plants. You're going back to try and assess an entire time in history, and because of that, you are dealing with all the facets of life that we deal with today. And so it only makes sense, and it only works if you are able to listen to other people. And the fact that Graham Hancock has all of this information at his disposal is proof enough that archaeologists collaborate with plenty of people outside of their field. Wow, well you notice that he didn't mention um, astronomers as part of the groups that the archaeologists generally collaborate with because they're not one of the groups that archaeologists generally collaborate with, which is why every single time archaeoastronomy has come up in one of the videos that I responded to either of the two Milos on, they have just basically just because they don't even fucking care. They don't acknowledge it. <laughs> In their worldview on the science of this, astronomy. Here's the here's the reason that Hancock says that. In a typical fashion, I think that Hancock's not being direct enough with his words. So I'll 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 fill in the gaps, and then I can be accused of being a political mouthpiece in the comments section. But anyway, what 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 I think Hancock is trying to say here: astronomy frequently will spit dates that archaeologists don't like. It's one thing to go to a temple like on Malta where you have a handful of stars based on the dates that you could potentially say these are the ones that could line up with what we have. It's another thing when you go and you're looking at an alignment that's based on the sun. It's pretty easy to tell if that was built a long ass time ago. And they don't like that, like what we're going to see here with Serpent Mound. We, they don't like that because they don't have any archaeology and it's actually some of the things that, have, that they fought about in the archaeoastronomy stuff they don't have any archaeology behind it at that point they don't have the archaeo part of the archaeoastronomy so what the issue is is where hancock is saying that these guys step on your toes is the dating they are very frequently pushing dates back much, much further because you're going by the oldest datable material and they're going by the orientation of the site to the stars or the sun. And if it's something like multiple points, like Giza, we'll talk about that in a later video, then it's kind of hard to argue that that's a different alignment when it, when it lines up at a certain time. And it's the same kind of thing with a solstice alignment or an equinoctial alignment. If it says that it would be in alignment 8,000 years ago, but the archaeology says it's 4,000 years ago, archaeologists are up in arms, and understandably so. Because somebody's coming in and saying all that digging and carbon dating, all that shit you're doing, well, that's all nice and good, but it's older than that. And for the same reason that we have the issue with Clovis first and people that are the Clovis police fighting against it, we have the same shit going on here where people have this emotional attachment to it and they, and they fight it. They fight it even when it doesn't necessarily make sense to do so. So we see a lot of problems with astronomy being integrated into sciences like archaeology, which is why there's a consistent pattern of people ignoring archaeoastronomy in the videos I'm responding to. Now, Graham Hancock does go on to clarify that he does not claim that Poverty Point was built by this lost advanced civilization, which I'm glad because that would be a rather foolish thing to say. But what he does say is that he is looking for evidence that this knowledge was inherited. Now, he never really specifies exactly what knowledge he's talking about, but I think it is safe to say that he's either talking about um, massive earthenwork constructions or, um, you know, solstice alignments and astronomy, uh, because those are kind of the two most, you know, out there and uh, advanced things that he talks about throughout the course of this episode. But once again, as I have said in every single episode of this so far, you do not need someone to come out of the ocean to teach you how to pile dirt up and look at the sky. I should probably send Potholer a gift basket because holy shit does the ability to point my phone at the TV come in handy in these debunkings. I'm not claiming that Poverty Point was created by the lost advanced civilization I'm looking for. 
But I'm interested in the origins of the sophisticated astronomy and geometry that were deployed here. Milo, buddy, I thought you said you didn't know what knowledge you were talking about here. I think he's pretty clear what knowledge we're talking about here, isn't he? Then you're using this position to like demonize the way that Hancock views the indigenous peoples. He's talking about advanced knowledge that should be outside of the realm of expectations for any Paleolithic peoples. That's his point. So he's not saying all oh, those stupid indigenous people had no clue how to do it. It's not that at all. He's saying that nobody back in those days should have had this kind of advanced geometry and astronomy. That's his take on it. Now, whether or not you agree with that, well, I guess we don't really need to ask that question, do we? But that doesn't mean his take isn't all gross. All right. So damn it, man. <sighs> You make me want to be mean and I like you. And you can see how that is a really dangerous way of thinking to imply that this group of people who built these mounds needed someone to come teach them how to do it. And so Graham Hancock pretty quickly actually uh, walks his own words back because he realizes that he is probably going to have quite a lot of people pointing at him uh, if he just decides to roll with this train of thought. And he goes on to say, like, of course they could do this by themselves, because, you know, the thing he's implying is that paleo indigenous Americans um, were incapable of piling dirt up. And I appreciate his sentiment. I'm glad that he specified I'm not saying they weren't capable of doing this and whatnot, but his point is a little bit moot when everything else that he says and all the evidence he presents throughout the rest of the episode is predicated on the idea that they were taught how to do this. So whether or not you're explicitly saying it, you still are kind of saying that they couldn't do it without an outsider's help. Okay, man, I mean, since you're going to keep hammering away at the same point, I guess I'll just keep debunking the same point. No. He's not saying that they can't pile dirt up, okay? So that's not what his take is. It's not that they maybe couldn't pile dirt up. It's not that they needed to be taught how to pile dirt up. It's that the idea of aligning these extremely long distances or doing all this goofy shit with the sun, according to him, is something that they shouldn't have been able to do, not because they were natives to North America, but because this group of people, like most other groups of people that far back in time, were not supposed to have had that kind of knowledge. That's the point he's getting at. Make, making it all gross is, is gross. He then does his classic, um, his, his, his special attack, where he lists all sorts of different sites around the world uh, that have uh, something in common. Uh, in this case, the thing that all the sites he lists have in common uh, is that they have a solstice orientation. I will say once again, what is the one thing all these places had in common? Is it that they were visited by Atlanteans or they could see the sun? As those of you who've watched my videos before know, I'm, I'm not going to give Hancock much slack here. Yeah, he's quick to, to jump the gun and, and attribute sites to to places that they shouldn't really be attributed to normally Atlantis or whatever. But, it, it, you know, it gets tricky because again, it's like, it's one thing to like to map the position of the sun. And I would definitely say that poverty point falls into that category. It's a calendar. I wouldn't say the calendar is anomalous. There are some things about poverty point. Um, as I was looking, I'll put some papers down here, some archaeoastronomy papers. Uh, one of the things, that it's an older paper, and I was blasted on Twitter for daring to touch an older paper and hold it up and say, I wonder about this. But <sighs> anyway, it, it has apparently has an alignment to um, an Olmec site, and I need to read into a little bit more, or to Leventa specifically. I need to read into it a little bit more because it's a little bit confusing as to which mounds they're referring to in the 80s paper, but they hadn't done LIDAR then. Um, because they have this anyway, I'll post the ones down below and um, you can take a look at it. But there was some back in the day when they thought the Olmecs were like the father culture of all of South America. There was um, some possibility from archaeoastronomers posited that Olmecs could have had some influence over the site. Worth mentioning. Anyway. It does seem to me like this is a calendar site, not so much a, a, a spot that's that's abnormal. The the alignment with Jackson Mound, on the other hand, that's pretty intriguing to me. Um, the potential alignment with Leventa, that's pretty interesting as well. But at the end of the day, that's not a whole lot of great evidence for these sites. It, it's just kind of like, well, it's a calendar, man. Um, 
Now, as we go to Serpent Mound, you'll see that I disagree with Milo's take on that quite a bit more. And then he brings up a bunch of other uh, North American mound sites, which also supposedly have solstice orientations. The mound sites that he talks about are, alongside Poverty Point, the Cahokia site, the Moundville site. I actually talked about that in my Grave Creek Stone video. Actually, once again, that name is so terribly bad. Saudi Nakuchi, the Atoa Mounds, and the Iowa Effigy Mounds. All right, now we're going to do an interactive activity where you're going to interact with yourself and I'm going to pretend like I can see you. Uh, what do all these things have in common? Uh, I'll give you 10 seconds. I'm kidding. I'm not giving you 10 seconds. If you guessed all of them are in North America and every single one of them could see the sun, you'd be absolutely right. It amazes me how readily Graham Hancock omits the idea of uh, cultural dissemination. The uh, idea that multiple people in the same geographic region would uh, collaborate with one another. They would share ideas with one another. The, the thoughts and the plans that people had would diffuse throughout different cultural groups. And as a result, you see a lot of similar themes uh, throughout different groups in the same area. And so it's no small wonder that uh, mounds were so important to these people. And it's also no small wonder that a uh, solstice orientation of these mounds was also important. I don't think that Hancock has a problem with the idea of cultural diffusion or that he even ignores it. I think that's kind of the core principle of his hypothesis, isn't it? So from like, if I may, from Hancock's perspective, right? Say like the Olmec alignment that I was just talking about from La Venta. So Quetzalcoatl comes after Atlantis is smoked and he shows up and starts teaching people how to not eat each other and do all this goofy shit and build things out of rocks and point them at suns and whatnot, right? So, cause we have three or four suns here on this planet, by the way. Anyway, so then all of that like slowly diffuses and the further north you get, the lack of stone for one, and then on top of that, the, uh, the diffusion of the culture, the further north you get, the less pronounced this cult of Quetzalcoatl is, but there's still some fingerprints of that god trickling through do you see do you see that cultural diffusion is like a core principle of his idea now the big grand slam that Graham hancock goes to in this video is a uh, serpent mound in ohio you have probably seen serpent mound if you have ever looked at a uh, book about the history of north america or have ever played red dead redemption 2. it is a spectacularly well-preserved effigy mound located in ohio in the united states and graham hancock absolutely loves it and i absolutely loved writing about this part because he says some crazy stuff so so Graham Hancock's uh, first qualm with this site is that the sign says that it is from 1000 AD, and Graham Hancock does not like that very much. So there's one thing I actually can agree with Graham Hancock on, and that is that the sign at Serpent Mound is incorrect. The Serpent Mound does not date to 1000 BCE. The oldest date that the Serpent Mound has been found to date to is around 320 BCE, making the Serpent Mound a little over 2000 years old, which is still crazy old. Here's where I have to throw Hancock a bone, man. You know, when the guy's stick is that archaeologists the biggest piece of crap on the whole planet and the mainstream version of history is entirely wrong yeah when he goes to a site that he's planning to hold up as evidence and the sign out front is just not only wrong but it's like wrong according to like mainstream archaeology which is kind of a big deal by the way especially in the midwest if you go around to a lot of these sites the sign that tells you what's going on there is shit the 1940s version of history and you, you scratch the surface you're like oh okay anyway um, so what, what do you expect from the guy, right? I mean, this, this is literally his shtick and, and they will get, they go and they drop like this golden nugget of perfection for him. He's like, I can hold up this smoking gun. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, you have to even admit it too. So no, it doesn't mean that everything's, that all those science is wrong about it. But again, Hancock is going to hold this one up, run around with it, parade it around, put it on his nipples and rub it with oil. It's it's going to happen. Do you think he's got an OnlyFans? By this point, North America was in the uh, early woodland period, which is uh, the uh, paleo-indigenous period, which refers to the people who lived um, about 500 BCE to about 1000 AD. And it is theorized that this is when the first construction at Serpent Mound happened. Now, you note I said first construction because uh, Serpent Mound was reconstructed twice throughout its history. And the second date that archaeologists found is that it dates to about 1000 CE, and I believe is attributed to the Fort Ancient, Fort Ancient people. So the site was reconstructed 
erupted in about 1000 CE uh, by the four ancient people. Now let's put a nice little bow on the uh, archaeological evidence here. I love this. It's really cool. It tells us that the site was reconstructed. It implies that it was an important site for more than one group of people. Can you imagine being in the four ancient civilization and stumbling across this thing that was built 1300 years before you were there and reconstructing it? It's amazing. Uh, now the problem with this is that it opened the gates for Graham Hancock to just be able to say, well, if it was reconstructed once, it must have been reconstructed for as long as is convenient for me to fit it into my hypothesis. And here we have that disdain for astronomy like we were talking about earlier. Hancock's going to say in a minute that the site is aligned to not our date, not the date that they found the carbon dating for, but what date? Say it with me, everybody. 10,500 BC, something like that, right? Well, at any rate, a long ass time ago, much further ago than the dating goes. So of course, archeologists push back against that, but they actually have some disdain for it because what if that's actually right? Then the idea that their carbon dating is missing shit is gonna be frustrating, but it does make sense. Look at our fossil record and stuff. Look at our record of, the, of history. We do, it's not, we, we find, what we find is threadbare compared to what actually existed. And we all know this. So to think that we're going to like be able to find the oldest datable material that was actually there when the site was constructed, like they left fucking sandwich wrappers and shit laying around. I mean, in some places, yes. In other places, uh, I don't know. Okay, that was pretty funny, but now we're about to get to the really funny part. Because this story gets so much better. Because the people at Serpent Mound decided to ban Hancock. I'm convinced that the reason Graham Hancock talks about Serpent Mound so much in this episode is purely because uh, they banned him from the site, and so he just saw it as a perfect opportunity to just continue his ceaseless browbeating of mainstream academia. <laughs> so the way that he tells us he was banned is hilarious. He's like, it is hard to get an accurate date of this site because they banned me from going there or something like that, which is just hilarious because it implies that Graham Hancock was going to show up there and do his own archaeological dig. All right, guys, I'm going to figure this out. I'm the rogue researcher and I'm going to drill a core and I'm going to get a radiocarbon date myself. There is no way that the people at Serpent Mound would have let you into the place with just like a bunch of testing equipment. Like you're some like, you know, like rogue John Wick researcher who's like, I'm here to get a radiocarbon date. Really? You think he was going to show up there with the radiocarbon dating team? This is something he's done in other places. Um, those of us that are Hancock fans know what he was planning to do when he got there. Archaeoastronomy. So, so what does Graham Hancock do after being banned from Serpent Mound? Well, I'll tell you. He goes to the gate outside of Serpent Mound and he stands there and he complains about how they're censoring him. Disembodied voice Milo back again with another editor's note. Uh, Graham Hancock actually wasn't banned from this site. A YouTube channel by the name of Digging Up Ancient Aliens actually got in touch with Serpent Mound to check this claim and found that in reality what had happened is Hancock had requested four days of commercial filming at the site. Now because four days of commercial filming at a site with a massive crew is a huge undertaking, uh, Serpent Mound declined his request, which is an important piece of context to have because Hancock talks about this site as if there were armed guards at the gate trying to keep him out. Obviously hyperbole there, but he, he didn't get banned from the site. And so it's really funny that he goes on to talk about how he's being censored by mainstream academia when they just told him that he can't film there for four days with his entire film crew at a, you know, active, important historical site and, you know, major tourist destination. Okay, we got a couple of things to break down here. Number one, Hancock does say that he was banned from the site, but he specifies that he was banned from filming. There's just one problem with investigating my theory. The administrators of Serpent Mound have decided to ban me. We've made repeated efforts to get permission to film here, but they denied us that permission. Okay, having gotten that out of the way, which is kind of a big deal, again, it shows that these people aren't even watching the videos all the way, man. Um, but. There's a lot of people that have gone out of the way to debunk Hancock here and prove that he's lying about it and they go get information that is, well, he was not, not only was he not allowed to film, but it was, he was not allowed to film because there was so many people there. So I went ahead and I called the people myself um, at Serpent Mound and here I'll, I, Washington's a two party state, so I can't record any conversations, but I'll post a screenshot here of my phone. You can see the phone number there. I spoke with this guy for a few minutes and uh, he was a public relations person 
and he specified as a public relations person he was very political in his speech he would not tell me straight up if the email was true if the email was not because my, my question is basically is he being banned because there was too many people there with his big film crew is it just inconvenient or is he being banned because there was native tribes that were ideologically opposed to him being there and they wouldn't give me a clear answer but they did acknowledge both reasons exist he did say that they work with native tribes and if the native tribes do not want people to film on one of these sites and they will be request they will be asked in these situations and if they say no the answer is no i said is the email bs or is the email accurate is it true and he would not say one way or the other but again he reiterated that the native tribes have a say in it so in political speak he tacitly admitted that that was the reason why which to be honest with you i completely get as when Milo talks about that here in a second, you'll see me agree with him 100% basically on that. But it's important to hold this up here because everybody's like, aha, Graham Hancock's full of shit. Look what we got him on. And really all it's proving is that they're just like so quick to do this debunk that they ain't even fucking watching what they're going to go after. <sighs> Jeez, please, man. I'm just so tired of hearing people who are not being censored complain about being censored. Just because somebody drew a boundary does not mean that you your like rights are being infringed. It's just so childish. He says that he was denied access to the site on ideological and personal grounds, which definitely makes it sound pretty intense. And now, honestly, this is an ethics question. So you are at your uh, full right to completely disagree with this and say that it is, you know, some form of censorship or uh, some form of restricting freedom of press uh, to, you know, not allow allow Graham uh, Hancock access to the site. And when I was first watching the episode, honestly, when he read the uh, email from Serpent Mound, I was sort of like, damn, that's a, that's a little harsh. Like, too bad he wasn't able to go there, even though I didn't really support what he was doing in the first place. But, you know, everyone should be given an equal opportunity. But as I thought about this a little bit more, I realized that it is infinitely more complicated than whether or not Graham Hancock can stand in front of a giant mound of dirt. Now, if you do think that this is an unethical thing to do, I don't blame you. But let me tell you this, just to sort of inform that opinion a little bit Bit further. Now, obviously, uh, the, the Serpent Mound is an archaeological site, but more importantly than that, it is a cultural site because the descendants of the people who built this mound uh, s still live here, and that site is still important to them. It's not quite like Gebekli Tepe or the Malta temples, where there's these sites that are so ancient that there's sort of really no living connection to them. But places like the Serpent Mound are some of the last remaining physical reminders of a faith system that once covered an entire continent. So think about how how disrespectful it would be if I were to go to uh, Temple Mount or to Calvary or something like that, a place with a huge amount of religious uh, and, and spiritual significance to a major world religion. And then I were to, you know, bring my camera crew in there and start drilling into the ground to get radiocarbon dates and telling everyone that it was built by Atlanteans. That would be just cripplingly disrespectful. And so just because this site isn't an important site for a Western religion or a religion that you hear about all the time doesn't mean that it still isn't a sacred site. And so to tie a little bow on it, yeah, it is totally within their right to tell Graham Hancock that he's not allowed to come there and preach about how this sacred religious site is a, uh, you know, fabrication by, I don't know, Atlanteans or something. And beyond that, I think that gives Graham Hancock even less of a right to whine about it as much as he does. Out the gate, I agree with Milo. Th there's people that still honor this site so like just treating it like it's just a place to dig and turn spades and dig up our history isn't really right at on the other side of things hancock has every right to be frustrated as fuck by that because okay kennewick man for those of you who don't remember i'm pretty sure that's the name of it if i get that wrong i'll put it up here if not i'll just leave it but um I'm here, I'm a local here in Washington, I'm pretty sure that's what it was, but it was a, a man that they was found that was a Native American uh, skeleton, skeletal remains, and it was a huge shit show between the archaeological community and the Native community, and they fought back and forth, and now it's not, now, now they both kind of have come to like this, you know, the, a soft truce when it comes to these sort of things, but, uh, this is a, a sticking point, man, because the uh, the uh, indigenous native beliefs of the United States, the Americas, they're not dead. There's a lot of people that still practice them, so you can't just go pissing all over these sites, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But 
when with your Hancock and everywhere you go, they're like, oh, you can't talk about the pyramids like that because you don't talk about the pyramids the way we like. And you don't talk about this serpent mound the way we like. And when we go to Malta, we see that they don't want to date the teeth right. And so it's the same kind of thing where it's this constant pushback. And a lot of times it's because this culture doesn't want to accept that somebody older than them had some influence on that. Even in places like Malta, where we know that's the case, at least they built uh, big temples there anyway, um, I can see where Hancock's coming from. So he has every right to bitch about it a lot. I do think that it's a little tone deaf of him to not be like, okay, they don't want me here for that reason. I totally get it. But at the same time, again, I do get why it's like, it's not the first time this kind of thing's happened to him. So he's just like, you guys, I, you can't really debunk me if you don't let me do my fucking research, right? Even if it is just looking at stars down the mouth of a freaking wood or uh, dirt snake. Anyway, lightening the mood. I think it's absolutely hilarious that Graham Hancock films this entire section just standing outside of the gates of Serpent Mound. Though he does say that the people at Serpent Mound are crushing opposing views by denying access. Which, Graham Hancock, the only thing that permission would have given you is just allowing you to be wrong on the other side of a fence. <laughs> they also uh, have someone fly a drone over Serpent Mound, which I don't know if, if that's legal. I'm assuming it is, or they wouldn't have done it, but I just think it's really funny. They're like, oh, you won't let me in? Well, what if I fly over it? Well, since they would let him on the site, obviously, Obviously, he could fly a drone over it, but that's not really the reason I'm responding to this little bit. Look at the disdain Milo has for him and how he's just like, oh, yeah, since you won't let me f film there, I'll just fly a drone over it. Like, that's really what Hancock's attitude would be. So you don't think that they flew with a drone over it because, like, they needed some footage for the Netflix special of Serpent Mound? And he's not allowed to bring a film crew there, but you could still bring a drone? No, I'm sure it was vindictive of him and that he was just sitting there the whole time going, you dirty motherfuckers, I'm buying the most expensive fish-eyed drone I can. The oldest the Serpent Mound has ever been dated to is about 2,000 years ago. So how old does Graham Hancock think it is? 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years? Graham Hancock thinks that the Serpent Mound is 10,000 years old. Shocking 8,000 years older than the actual recorded date. Now, what is his evidence for pushing the date back by, uh, you know, what, five times older than it actually is? Uh, his evidence is, oh, Serpent Mound is a solstice-oriented site where the summer solstice sun will set in the serpent's mouth and uh, at the back of of one of the curves in its tail, the winter solstice sun rises. It's an amazing uh, sight, and it has some wonderful um, astronomical alignments. Um, but his theory is that because the mouth is uh, two degrees off from where the sun rises on the summer solstice, it must have been built 10,000 years ago because that's when it would have lined up perfectly. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but uh, to expect that people building a mound out of dirt would be able to do it with such mathematical precision uh, using degrees and things that we use today seems like a b bit of a stretch. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you look at that, Milo is finally catching on. Welcome to the fold, buddy. Yeah, it would be a little weird for people back then to be using degrees and shit like that, wouldn't it? Kind of nuts when they line up that shit at Poverty Point to that Jackson Mound way the fuck south of it. Oh, that's kind of wild all of a sudden. When you, when you think about it like that, it gets pretty crazy, doesn't it? Huh. Hmm. Yes, it's nuts to think that they would have had access to those kinds of things, yet we have evidence in places that they did use the accurate of measurements to build their shit, which is why he's looking at it here going, why is it off a little bit? And, and let's be clear, it would need to be looked into, and this is why he's pissy that he can't go there. Um, you've got all those different mounds that do all these different things, if you go there and you take your measurements on all of these and you're looking at potentially being much older than it is, and so you're checking for a procession of the equinoxes having knocked things out of alignment, if they all shared a similar error, that would be pretty good evidence, wouldn't it? And if one or two of them did, well, then it's not. So I don't have the information at hand. I don't think Hancock does either, and I think that's what the issue is here. Um, I intend to look more into this in the future, but as it is right now, I, I'm undecided on whether or not Serpent Mound is actually much older than what it is currently dated at based on the astronomy. 
But another quick thing to point out here is for somebody who claims to have no problem working with other fields, if astronomy was to thump the date of our archaeology right on the noodle and say, well, this site's much older, he's going to push back. Graham Hancock's uh, reasoning for why it must be that, you know, two degree off thing is why would you go through all this effort and not get it exactly right? I <laughs> can't argue with that, Graham. Well, yeah, why didn't they get it right? Yeah, uh, those idiots. But this dating method is something which we have seen him use before. He used the star Sirius to date the Gigantia temples to conveniently line up uh, with his hypothesis. He is now doing the same thing at the mound complexes in North America. And I never thought I'd have to say this, uh, but hypothesizing that something is lined up with a star and then just trying to find when the star lined up better than it does now is not a way that you date something in archaeology. It just, that's, that just doesn't work. You're going to need to do something a little more concrete. I don't know, maybe like radiocarbon dating. I'll uh, post a picture of that there uh, Hoover Dam star chart that I brought up before that is built with the intention of communicating the building date of the Hoover Dam to future generations through astronomical means. You'd be pretty smart to get it. You couldn't be like a bonehead astronomer, but if you're a good astronomer, that will tell you when the place was built. Better than any carbon dating would. I, I would put it to you unless they pull the body of somebody who built Hoover Dam out of the dam proper, which there's probably a few people in there. That usually happened back in those days. Um, with the exception of that, if they were, imagine humanity died off right now. And imagine just for argument's sake that, the, that there is no carbon datable material in Hoover Dam itself. Just, it's, it's just concrete that cannot be dated. So 2000 years go into the future. The carbon dating on it's gonna be like 80 years off, right? But that star chart won't. A star chart will be fucking perfect. Hmm. Take that information and do whatever you want with it. But anyway, Graham Hancock's master plan is that this uh, site goes back about 10,000 years. And he even pushes a little more to about 12,800 in his, his big, uh, you know, Younger Dryas theory thing. And one of his other theses for this is that uh, this is the farthest south that the Laurentide ice sheet traveled. And so he suggests that while the ice sheet was at its maximum extent, ancient people built Serpent Mound at the foot of the Laurentide ice sheet. And this is one of the places where I got to point out that Hancock is way out there. Milo's right. This is Game of Thrones shit to think that people would be living in the shadow of a glacier and like living a life. That's insanity. It's, that's not how it's going to work. They're going to be getting the hell away from there as best as they possibly can. If they are living and eking out an existence on that land, the last thing they're going to be doing is building giant mounds in that frozen dirt. Chair. He then goes on to mention more folklore. He talks about Iroquois myth, where there was a serpent in the sky that was like struck down with lightning, and he uses that to talk about the fact that there was a meteor or something. And then he claims that the uh, uh, serpent mound or the serpent mound was uh, a depiction of a meteor streaking across the sky. Now, uh, the, the idea that the serpent mound is a depiction of a meteor is nothing new. In fact, one of the uh, major running theories right now is that serpent mound may, in some way, represent Halley's comet, which just so happened to become visible in 1066 A.D., which also happens. To Oh, I got rid of it. But it just so happens to be around the same date that Serpent Mound was reconstructed uh, by the Fort Ancient people. And so it's not impossible this is a meteorite. Is it the one that uh, triggered the Younger Dryas? Probably not. And that's the end of episode six. We're going to resume with uh, lesson seven after a brief break. First of all, I want you to notice how Milo just ignores the myths there. Bad Milo. If you want to debunk Graham Hancock, you can't just ignore the myths. The second thing, though, that's worth noting here is we're talking about this uh, being emulating Halley's Comet on the ground as opposed to being the comet, right? Um, I am not aware of any other sites that are attributed to being comets. I, I, you know, it's the sun, it's the stars, it's the moon, it's a planet, it's the sun, it's the sun, it's the sun, but it's never... It's never that I'm aware of comets. Now, I'm sure there are some published papers on this. Uh, this, I mean, obviously, right, Milo's probably referencing them right there. But my point is, is that this would be very anomalous in order for it to be a comet, a Halley's Comet even. But if it was like the Earth Ender, the Civilization Killer, that would make sense that it would be immortalized in the ground. Just a comet that flew through the sky, though, 
it would have had to have had, I mean, possibly, but you would have had to have had some pretty crazy shit going on at the same time to, to like dovetail with it in my mind. They would have to have had a reason to attribute something powerful on Earth to that comet. But anyway, we could sit here and get into the differences between me and Milo on archaeoastronomy all day long, but as we've well established at this point, he's not into that at all, and I very much am. But thanks very much for watching this far. I appreciate you taking the time to check out this video and wait all the way to the end to listen to me babble about all this different random shenanigans. Uh, don't forget to click the like and subscribe and all those fancy bells and all that other crap, and we will see you next time.